I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to the Q&A. Tom, would you like to make an announcement before we get started? Yes, I would. I would. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And, you know, we, we've taken a look at the stats and a very, very small percentage of the people who listen to the show have subscribed. So if you like the show, uh, of course, we want you to let us know with a like and subscribe and click the bell so that you get all the uh, notifications of the latest, uh, of the newest postings that we make. But yeah, click subscribe and share. That helps us tremendously. And uh, YouTube loves it. The algorithm just feeds on it like a dog with a bowl of food. Uh, <laughs> and um, if you want to take it a step further, you can do that. Just go to patreon.com forward slash Creek Devil and just follow your nose. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, we always put the link to Patreon in the description in YouTube. Click on that. Same thing. Just follow your nose. So with that said, uh, I'll hand it back to Will. Okay, Tom, what sort of questions do you have for us today? Okay, Jan uh, wants to know, she says, I love the show. How are these creatures able to sneak up on people and not be heard? And, you know, that's something we would like to know, but... Will, what are your thoughts? They're stealthy little buggers. Well, the one thing that always strikes me is how thick their foot pad is. And and the foot isn't rigid like ours, you know, where we when we walk even barefooted, you know, the least little thing, you know, makes a noise like twig snapping and things like that with well, a Sasquatch. And I've got a lot of footprint casts and they all show how the foot pad conforms around rigid objects on the ground. Uh, what do you what do you guys think, Forrest? What do you think? Well, the uh, <clears throat> mid torsal break in the foot uh, is what you're referring to. Is the uh, <clears throat> the you have to excuse me. I've uh, got a little bit of a sore throat this morning. Uh, anyway, that mid torsal break uh, is causes that foot to be more like a hand um, in that regard. It's very much like uh, other primate foots. However, it likes the um, the toe is in line with the the big toe is in line on their foot, like our foot. But it does have that uh, primate break in the middle. So I think that has a lot to do with it. And um, any animal that uh, like dogs, cats, or anything express a uh, heavier pad on padding on the bottom of their foot, which helps with uh, suppressing the noise and such. But we do hear uh, periodically of people uh, that are camping that hear them breaking. Uh, I mean, let's face it, uh, primates make mistakes. <laughs> All of them do. And uh, you hear periodically of people saying that they, they do hear them stepping on uh, pieces of wood or branches or such that, that uh, make noise. And alert, alert campers and uh, people in the woods that of their presence. You know, in in the documentary we have coming out soon, we actually recorded that on a few times. You remember, Tom? Uh, and I don't think we didn't know it at the time, but the the parabolic mic and Adam's other microphones were picking that stuff up that was outside of our range of hearing. So it was, uh, and yeah, it's, it's been our personal experience as well that yeah. Um, we have, you know, I know that um, way back in that same area that will remain nameless, I was up there with two gentlemen that shall remain nameless. And we were um, well, we were just <clears throat> basically looking for one. We found it. Funny, you find what you're looking for. Uh, <laughs> and that's exactly what it was. The the twig snaps or whatever it was brushing against trees. I don't know what it was, but they were very subtle 
a little twig snap here, a little twig snap there. But in this case, that foul, foul, uh, wretched odor now was also following us. It was parallel, and it was about 30 feet away from us, so it wasn't that far away. You apparently ticked it uh, off. <laughs> we we did. The... Go ahead, Tom. Well, I was just going to say, and I know what we did. I'm not going to say on the on the air what we did, but we had provoked it. And Will, when you and I and Will um, Adam and and the team were there, both times when we got surrounded by these things, you could hear the very subtle little twig snap here, little something that if you didn't know what you were listening for. It wouldn't, you know, you'd never know. It wouldn't make, you know, you you just brush it off. No pun intended. But you, you have three elements happening with these situations. The first one is like Forrest mentioned. You got the mid tarsal break in the foot, which means the foot itself can move in such a way that it's not a rigid setup like our foot is. Secondly, you got that really thick foot pad that conforms around rigid objects objects on the ground. And then the third element is the fact that these things are a predator. And predators, like big cats, are pretty much always in stealth mode when they're moving. Doesn't mean they're silent, but and it depends on what kind of material they're going through. Uh, if they also know... They also know their area sure. extremely well yeah. and where to put their feet, where not to put their feet. And if they are able to see in the dark, like a lot of people believe, they're going to see things in their way and they can avoid them. Yeah, they're not just some bumbling animal out there. Yeah. Okay, Tom, what else do we have? Tom must be looking up the question. <laughs> <laughs> No, I I had you on mute. I was giving oh. you the answer, but uh, <laughs> you guys just weren't listening. Uh, Come on, see, get with it, man. <laughs> I'm telling you, first cup of coffee. All right. So this person wants to know: Do you think the book, and it sounds like it's titled "The Creased the Creature," personal experience with Bigfoot, could be a true story or made up? Uh, please give a reason for your answer. I. I'm not familiar with the book, so I, I can't I, comment, and I don't either. know if anybody else. Yeah, I've never heard of it till now myself, so I couldn't comment on it. There's quite a few books out there, so, um, yeah, you know, if you want to provide us some extra information, you know, we'll, we'll see if we can give you a better answer next time around. Now, here's a thought, too. There's a, of course, we, uh, we're doing a new show now called The Bigfoot Breakdown, and it's old stories, current stories, you know, books like that, that it contain <laughs> stories, current events, past events, uh, where we sort of break those elements down and, and see, you know, if it's something that we think is real or not and why. But um, that's, uh, that's something we can look into for that particular discussion. Does this mean we have to give book reports? I graduated high school just to avoid <laughs> doing that anymore. No, no, we no. have to do book re chapter reports, <laughs> book reports, but, absolutely. But, David, you will have to stand in front of the class and read your uh, answer out loud, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I used to hate that okay. as a kid. I couldn't yeah. stand it either. Well, but it, 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 if nothing else, it taught you how to speak in public and, and shake and quiver. And, and so. look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and pray that the teacher didn't see you as you're just slunking down in your chair. <laughs> right. Oh, man. I'm bringing back trauma memories. How okay. How can you become? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is for Hi, Will and Tom. This is from a gentleman named Forrest. Or it's not Forrest. Joseph. But I'm going to direct this first and foremost to Forrest. And here's the question. It says, what is known about Bigfoot's or Sasquatch sleeping habits? Uh, when do they sleep? How many sleep periods do they go through in a 24-hour period, in a 24-hour day? Uh, and this is actually multiple questions, so let's let's answer that, and then I will, I will add the other ones. Are you directing that at me? I am, yes. It's lobbing a grenade in your direction. <laughs> <laughs> no, the grenade just blew up. 
Uh, okay. Um, I haven't a clue. Uh, you know, we, we hear reports all the time, and of course my experiences have always mostly been at night, so they seem to be nocturnal um, quite a bit. Uh, that's not to say that they don't come out during the day because they obviously do because we have obvious daylight sightings all the time too but uh, they seem to be more nighttime sightings than uh, uh, so they seem to be more nocturnal uh, I, I tend to think they're probably diurnal uh, they can, they do uh, come out during the day and at night but seem to be more nighttime than the other but anyway um, so I would assume that they do a lot of sleeping during the day and find a cool spot, um, make a bed. I mean, I think you have seen uh, evidence that uh, of bedding areas and uh, trees and under trees. So um, I, I think they're gorilla-like in that regard, that they make uh, beds for themselves, uh, you know, for comfortable sleeping. And I'm assuming that they probably do most of their sleeping during the day. But like a lot of primates, they're just like people. Uh, they probably nod off during the night and at different times and um, nap. <laughs> um, so you see that in monkeys and apes that they just nod off at uh, periods of time and, you know, when they're not doing anything, when they're not feeding. So uh, I would imagine that they're going to follow the same type of uh, lifestyle. Yeah, I agree. I agree on the diurnal um assessment that i think that's what they are also because you know we get plenty of reports in the daytime as well as nighttime hours and you're right majority is night and the reason for that i believe is because um there's more reports around sunset and sunrise and that's when the game animals are moving but uh, even humans you know i remember from my my anthropology courses in ancient times uh where they talked about <laughs> You know, there was a point where humans didn't even sleep an eight-hour block like we do today, and, and they think that was more to conform towards, you know, when humans became farming and they sort of had to work during certain hours and could sleep during certain hours as opposed to hunting and gathering. So um, they probably, you know, like other other primates, they, they sleep a little bit here and there and they're awake here and there. It's not It's not a consistent schedule throughout a 24-hour period. That's an I've interesting turn. They were Go ahead, Tate. Well, I was just gonna say I saw a documentary on on exactly that, that this business of sleeping eight hours and getting up and going to work is fairly new. It's kind mm -hmm. of a modern right. thing. And even back in George Washington's day, um, and before then, it was common for people to sleep a little bit, maybe get up at two in the morning. Uh, get something to eat, you know, rustle around, do a few things, and then go back to bed. And and uh, personally, I, I kind of like that well, you sleep see, pattern. You see some of the studies now that are saying, you know, power naps midday are a good thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, think we, I think we lost someone. <laughs> I didn't know Chuck was on here. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, now, I'd man. always heard that they were mostly <laughs> nocturnal, but the group will find a place to bed down, and they'll usually have like a sentry posted one that'll stay awake in case anyone or anything comes too close to their area. He can wake them up and they can move on. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree. We don't really know. I mean, you know, that's certainly possible. Yeah, it's and, speculation. And a lot of times the juvies are the ones seen, so they're probably being used as uh, sentries. Yes. Right. That was that was the experience the three of us had uh, up in we'll just call it the area mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I don't know three years ago and we went in and and it was dead silent it was 102 degrees outside middle of the day uh, not a sound I could almost quote from uh, the Christmas Carol not a creature was stirring not even a mouse <laughs> and we rousted one. And that's when it all started. So, uh, and it was a juvie. It was definitely a juvie. Right. Okay. Um, and then this third part of the question is, and and again, I'll, I'll just ask. We'll start with Forrest, if that's okay with you, Forrest. Um, do they prepare beds like other 
primates? Do they sleep in trees or on the ground? And what is known about them sweet? What is known about Sasquatch swimming in waters too deep to walk through? Great work. Love your podcast, Joseph. There's a mouthful. Well, uh, I think I made an allusion to when we were discussing the sleeping habits uh, to uh, bedding down. Um, I mean, Chuck has seen evidence of them bedding, uh, making beds, uh, and I think you have too, Will, and mm-hmm. I think you also reported an account of uh, a bed uh, that you found located in a tree. That's very gorilla-like. Uh, chimpanzees uh, don't do that. Uh, they haven't even found much evidence of the, the billy apes or bondi apes, a.k.a. A bondi apes uh, making beds on the ground, uh, but they do sleep on the ground like uh, gorillas do, where the standard hand troglodyte, which is your standard chimpanzee, they actually sleep in trees. So I think that Bigfoot uh, does both. Uh, I think whatever's convenient to them at the time, and it may be that maybe juvies and, and younger ones actually do the sleeping in the trees, and the the adults may be the ones that are actually bedding on the, the forest floor. I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen a... <laughs> I haven't followed a group of Bigfoot around to attest to that. So um, now the other question was uh, swimming. Now, I do believe that we have a lot of uh, reports, especially in the, uh, on the Oregon and Washington border there at the Columbia River, of uh, them swimming across the the Columbia River, which is a no small feat, I might add. Uh, I wouldn't get in that water. Um, I don't, I'm assuming that they swim just like um, other monkeys do. Now, chimpanzees don't make a habit of swimming. They really don't have a like for water. Uh, neither do gorillas. Uh, but macaques, <clears throat> love water and the way they swim is they dog paddle so i'm assuming that that's probably the way that bigfoot does it um so i don't think that i've gotten or heard of any reports that they they are real water uh you know lovers um you know like they're jumping in there to just play in the water and swim in the water but we do know that they uh, I mean, for recreational purposes, but I do know that we've heard that they go across that Columbia River quite frequently. And like I say, that's no small feat in, in it doing that in itself. Yeah, they're not afraid of water. I've always heard they're, they're excellent swimmers, and people have actually observed them doing that. Many times, Very yes. strong swimmers. Yeah, many yeah. times. Well, I don't know if y'all have ever seen videos of uh, macaques, but... Uh, uh, macaques will actually get up high up in the trees and then jump off into the, uh, you know, uh, belly flops into rivers and ponds and stuff like that. They love to do that. But, uh, you know, I don't know. Have you ever heard of a, a Bigfoot playing in the water? I've, I've never heard of that. No, I'm not I aware mean, of any I, stories like that. Nope. I think they probably do it out of necessity. I don't necessarily think they get out there and play in water. No, I don't think so either. Well, it does remind me of that story, Will, of those guys. I don't know if they're in a canoe or a boat, and things swam underneath it. And didn't it grab the boat and and start trying to flip it over? Well, T.W. told us an account in um, uh, it's an area east of Albuquerque, New Mexico, where there were some, uh, I don't know if they were teenagers or people in their, guys in their 20s, were out in that pond or small lake fishing at night and and one of these things went out there and now he didn't say it went under the boat he said it just it just went out there and flipped the boat over or the raft whatever it was they were on well who knows maybe they were playing hey watch this check this out yeah, <laughs> we're gonna freak, I don't know. we're gonna freak these guys out really bad <laughs> yeah well that would do it yeah um 
Okay, so this is from Danny, and Danny says, hey, Tom, hope you're doing better. Um, thank, thank you, Danny. I appreciate that. I, I appreciate the thought. Um, and then he goes on, he says, we'll uh, mapped out the circuit of a group of Bigfoot uh, in Washington. And he said, we have a group from the high country every December heading south. And I think he's in the southern Sierra somewhere. Any suggestions on finding the rest of their route? Uh, we don't have the time that you spent, but even finding another point or two would be very cool. Um, any suggestions? What do you got? Well, what I did was I started mapping out where the sightings were and noting the time period. Not so much the year, but, well, by year, but you look at the month. And, um, and you know, if you get enough reports, you can establish a pattern. And then you look at it year by year. It's a little time consuming, but, uh, and, and the patterns are always different. It's not, they're not doing the same thing. It's sort of dictated by the um, layout of the terrain. So you have to, uh, it's kind of a boots on the ground, so to speak. It is. I mean, you can, you can do the research through newspaper articles or, you know, reports, and then, you you know, I, I would check the veracity of some of those reports just to make sure that, you know, you're not getting your leg pulled. But um, when I was doing, well, of course, when I was doing it, it was more boots on the ground because, um, you know, there were articles, but it was more helpful to actually go out and talk to people in those areas uh, who wouldn't report things normally. So I gathered a lot of information that way. And then once I, once I kind of got a, oh, I guess a bare bones skeleton uh, of the pattern, you know, then I would start going to those places during, you know, the 30 day period that these things would be seen in those places. And then I, I could find evidence to support that. So that's how I was able to build that pattern. It's you usually know, a case of them following the food in the game, isn't it? Cause they don't want to deplete an area to the point there's nothing left. They'll move on somewhere else, but they don't keep well, that's, the same path. Yeah, that's that's one of the reasons they move as often as they do. And, and you're looking at roughly, typically, a 14-day time period. Right. Uh, not only to keep the area from being depleted, but once, once the prey animals are aware that they are there, they'll flee the area as well. So by them keeping well, moving another... these things, they, they sort of keep the game animals off guard. Yeah. Well, I, and I'm just digging a little deeper into the question here. It's it's interesting. Uh, Danny, you say that uh, you have a group moving from the high country every December. That is very good information, if I'm not mistaken, and they're heading south. So um, I don't have any details. We don't have any details on, on how you obtain that information, but that is... Uh, golden did you get that from from report or from you know from footprints or other evidence and Danny because uh, that's something to follow follow up on Danny if you contact me personally at wjevning at gmail.com I'll tell you what direction they're going in because I, I know about that area awesome well there we go um, and then PS he says do we have mr. black's number handy we do but we don't give it out. <laughs> no, no. And I'm sorry, I haven't I haven't done anything with that the rest of that interview yet because uh, we're we're in the middle of preparing three houses for sale and uh, uh, moving to New Mexico. So we have to sell three houses, and then we're buying one and moving everything. And it's been a real uh, everything's been really up in the air for us. So sorry about that, folks. I'll I'll get to that as soon as I can, but it might be. A uh, few months yet, so. So you're hip deep in alligator, so to speak. Yeah, Mr. Black and I chatted a bit yesterday, but uh, uh, it wasn't so much on on these topics. It was more about just chatting about personal stuff. Yeah. But he's still there. He's still very much communicative, and he and he wants to record some more things on on other topics that he was privy to in his tenure with the organization he was with so um we will have that down the road but right now i'm i'm definitely like you said hip deep in alligator so you know I, yeah i thought i thought retiring would be relaxing but i've been busier 
in the past three months since I retired. Then, and and the guys I worked with are like, "Oh yeah, you're going to be bored. You'll be back here in a couple of weeks." I'm like, "Yeah, right." <laughs> I could have told you that. I'm telling you, once I retired, it was like, "Wow, I got a." T- How does that happen? Maybe, maybe ten um, years from now, I'll be able to retire from retirement. <laughs> no, no kidding. Happen. I've been retired since 2012, and it just gets worse. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> you know, I can't complain, though. I like being busy, so. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so this is from a gentleman named Gene. Sounds like he's down in Florida. I'm not really sure. He says, Will or Tom, I'm sorry, but if Florida had a Sasquatch 100 feet and down the size, they'd be dead or known a long time ago, as many people here that hunt or poach in the woods statewide for a hundred years now, we'd know it. Uh, they would have uh, killed them outright. He sent a link. So I think, yeah, it looks like an encounter with multiple Sasquatch. Uh, I th- it, 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 what, what I'm going to do is try to distill a question out of this. This is more of a statement, but um, yeah, somebody uh, apparently in this length, there's pictures of a Bigfoot, 100 foot tall. I'm well, going out on big. a limb here. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's crazy. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to say if they were 30 feet tall, they would be, you know, they don't even get to that. So, you know, times that by three and some, and no, 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 no. <laughs> no, you're, you're talking about a creature that's an adult anywhere from, you know, around six feet upwards in the upper ranges of nine feet. They can't exceed that, but tip, that's a typical range. Is the average one is around seven, eight feet tall. Um, and you look at an area where that's infested with uh, these pythons and stuff, you know, and, and they can't get rid of those. So how are they going to get rid of, you know, something that, that's easily evading people when the snakes aren't? You know, right. That's, and that's maybe my they... question. Well, and if they would only develop a taste for reptiles, I know. Of course, that would include the alligators and well, you everything know, else. They they probably do eat those things, but you know they're not on a, on a scale large enough to be able to do anything real uh, in terms of putting a dent in those populations. Right, right. I have a funny story on that uh, when I was down in South Florida a few years ago with a group. Uh, working for a corporation, they sent us down there, and this one gal was there, and she'd been there earlier in the Everglades. And long story short, um, there was a bird that kept make a crow that was on the ground, kept making this squawking sound, and it kept hopping along, hopping along. And she was looking at an alligator way out there, off in the Everglades. And then, as it's hopping along, she's looking to see what it's doing you know she's very much into wildlife she turns around and now that alligator is just right behind her mm-hmm. and she goes i know what it is the crow and the alligator are working together the crow goes watch this <laughs> yeah, we're probably. gonna split the dividends here <laughs> oh no oh, well man. we probably have time for one more question if we have it we do. Um, I've got a few of them. I, I got to say some of these questions and I, we love the questions. We really do. Some of them come in the form of what I call uh, dissertation manifestos with no punctuation, uh, <laughs> just a, a single run on sentence. So I have to go through and distill those. So if you have a question for us, uh, send it. If it's got to be a dissertation manifesto, so be it. That's better than nothing at all. Um, but this one would, looks like it could have been broken down into multiple paragraphs. That's okay, Tom. Um, we so, we can, you can distill the questions out. We can, we're running pretty short on time. So, um, let's, uh, save those for next week. All right. That sounds awesome. And, uh, we'll dig through those and we, we will, we'll get to them. Absolutely. So, and, uh, one other thing, oh, if, ahead. if you sent us a question and we haven't responded, um, Send it again and just put a little note in there and say, hey, you know, I asked this, you know, uh, way back when and I didn't hear the answer. Uh, Would you guys be okay with, uh, you know, addressing this question again? We'd be more than happy to do that. And I, you know, I'm really sorry to say I I was 
responding with um, uh, comments on YouTube this morning, and there was one, and I, I wish I could remember the name of the person who sent it, but it was about them having a, a short video, apparently, of the creatures or something like that. And I was going to respond about how to send us the link to that video. And the question vanished. And I, I don't know where it is. Um, hopefully, it'll come back on well, there. If it doesn't, you know, if the person's listening, uh, you can send it to um, either me personally or at wjebning at gmail.com. Or, Tom, do you want him to send it to you? Yeah, absolutely. Send it to, uh, and this goes, this is for the whole group. You send it to questions, that's questions, plural, at creekdevil.com. And also, if you've had an encounter or just have a comment or something like that, but especially if you have an encounter or a question, we want to hear from you. Any communication, send it to questions at creekdevil.com. And I would say if, if it's an encounter, in the subject line, just put, I have an encounter, or just put encounter in there, and that'll be sufficient. And uh, also, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, also, if you want to join us on Campfire Talk just to sit around and chew the fat with us. Uh, get in touch and let us know. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, guys. I think with that, we'll just wrap this session up. So thanks for the questions, everyone, and thanks for stopping by. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.